Happy's Reflections. G'day, Terry. Yeah, hi, Paul. Now, you're a former senior policeman, so you're well-placed to talk us through the prioritising of resources. For example, police today renewed an appeal for public assistance as they continued to investigate the disappearance of a 45-year-old man from Lake Macquarie a couple of years ago. He was seen Christmas Eve 2019. How does this one become the subject of a media conference when others remain in their manila folders on a, a storeroom shelf somewhere? What's the process? Yeah, look, it's uh, the, the resources of the police are finite. That's the first thing I guess people need to realise. So, you know, you could have any number of unsolved cases. They can't uh, be putting all their resources into them all the time. So what they do is they prioritise, as you suggested. And uh, generally, if you look at uh, homicides, you have those that are uh, easily solved or self-solvers. Uh, you know, an example of that is you turn up to a house and there's a person there with blood a knife and there's a dead person stabbed. That's going to be easily solved. Then the next category are those that can be solved with a medium of effort. And the last ones are those that are highly unlikely to be solved. And many of them are your cold cases. But what happens is as time goes on, police go back and review these cases. Uh, and there may be evidence, uh, you know, an evidence review, etc., in terms of witnesses or forensic evidence. And they'll identify new strategies and new areas to conduct investigative inquiries. And from that, they can then say, well, we think this job is worth putting some resources into and we will go forward with the strategy. And often when you see these media appeals come out, there's other strategies taking place in the background, uh, covert strategies, etc., uh, at the same time. So, you know, the police put uh, some... Uh, great deal of thought into how they'll approach the murder or the investigation of the homicide and move it forward. Terry, what's, how do you feel as a police officer when you've got a fairly good inkling as you, I mean, you got to a very high level, you were a senior, senior policeman and you wouldn't rapidly run to a conclusion, I wouldn't imagine, based on the evidence. But often that evidence is still not enough. It's enough to firm up your belief, but it's not enough to lead to prosecution. How do you feel like a police officer in in those, or as a police officer in those circumstances? Well, you know, you know as you said, you, you need to remain unbiased and, uh, you know, resist tunnel vision and think, oh, there must be this person. I mean, there's a hierarchy of suspicion in uh, homicides and, you know, often you'll see if they turn up to... Uh, there was a case, I think, uh, a year or two ago where they turned up and arrested the husband because the children and the wife were dead. Um, it turned out that uh, she had killed herself and her children. Now, you know, that's just a hierarchy of suspicion. Police would probably be uh, negligent if they didn't look at the husband first to eliminate him as a suspect. So, uh, you know, you can go through these jobs and, you know, you look at them and uh, you may have a suspicion as to someone's done uh, a certain act. The problem is, in most of our uh, jurisdictions, we have rules around double jeopardy. So you only get one uh, go at charging someone and convicting them. Uh, there are some exceptions where there's compelling new evidence, etc. But, you know, the general rule of thumb is that once you charge someone and you lose it, it's going to be very difficult to recharge them with that matter. And we've deliberately set our system up that way to avoid, uh, you know, the onerous uh, prosecution of people. So, I mean, you really uh, need to be sure that you've got a good chance of success. Um, you need to make sure that the evidence is going to meet the court's expectations, and that is beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, we must prove that, and it's important we have that level of uh, requirement in terms of evidence. Um, and people are innocent until they are proven to that level of evidence. Terry, what about the role we see the million dollar award trotted out from time to time? I mentioned that it applies in the William, the sad case of William Tyrrell, the little boy that's missing, the Spider Man boy. Is that a Hail Mary play from, from coppers, just hoping to drag something out, or, or would it most likely be applied in cases? And, and we, we're going to talk next about a couple of, of difficult ones because, um, I mean, uh, without jumping to conclusions, one would suspect that, that William Tyrrell is deceased. Um, no body, of course, and likewise with Lynette Dawson, yet Chris Dawson was convicted. So what role does, does the reward play in cases from the, those cases from the police perspective? Yeah, look, rewards are a really good investigative tool uh, in terms of generating information. And when you come into any investigation, but particularly homicide investigations, police are coming from a, what we term a low information state and they're trying to acquire information to move to a high information state. One way you do that is through the offering of rewards. And traditionally, um, they're usually uh, for cold cases. I mean, I did one up here 
uh, for a fellow who'd been dead for 10 years and we offered a reward to generate interest in the job. Uh, but you are seeing them now being offered very quickly. In the Cleo Smith case, yeah. uh, the young girl in uh, WA was an example where within days a reward was offered to keep uh, the investigation on the forefront of the media. So there's been a change in tactics as to how police use uh, rewards. Um, and look, they are quite useful. Uh, you know, they do get paid out. People do actually claim them. Sometimes I think people think that no one ever claims them, but uh, they do. Um, you know, I had some data from the Queensland Police where they were paying out $50,000, and I think to maximum of 100 for information in relation to some old murders over a period of years. So. Uh, they are useful. I mean, they're like the media. They're a useful investigative tool. Yeah. Uh, just in regard to the media, what did you make of Teachers Pat and the role it played in the prosecution of Chris Dawson? Well, I think the media is uh, very important in terms of criminal investigations. In my time with the police, uh, I always actively engaged with the media, and that caused some consternation amongst other police who really didn't see the media as being that beneficial. I took a different viewpoint totally to that. They need to be managed, but they are really good at applying tactical pressure to suspects and driving that uh, information uh, issue that I was talking about before. In terms of podcasts and true crime, uh, they're just, uh, I guess, where we've moved to now. It's a new genre. People have a fascination with crime and uh, trying to understand how someone could do something like uh, kill another human being. Uh, those ones uh, where you have no body, uh, even more interesting, you know, is the person dead, aren't they dead, where no one has been charged, those questions are there as to why has no one been charged, someone must have killed them, uh, all those things. Um, so they're, they're really interesting. I mean, the cases where there's no body, uh, you know, we all kind of assume, yes, they've been killed, but we had a case of Natasha Ryan up here who was missing for, I think, 10 years. They charged someone with her murder, and then during a the trial, they actually found her in a cupboard up here alive. So, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of twists and turns in these cases where there's no body located. Yeah, okay. What about the role of family members? That must play a part as well. If someone refuses to give up, if they're banging the drum all all the way, then obviously uh, the police and others will notice them more. Well, that's right. I mean, the efforts of family, the survivors are quite important. And I think the best case you've ever seen of that is the Morecambe's and how they actively kept uh, the case of Daniel in the media, spotlight. Um, you know, anniversaries were celebrating, et cetera. And I think they are probably the epitome of, you know, a victim's family, making sure that the, the person is not forgotten uh, and that the police focus remains on that. I mean, uh, you know, it's the same as you talk about miscarriages of justice, we have an innocent person in jail. Uh, it's the media that drive the interest in those cases and inevitably gets that person another opportunity to get out. The same applies for miscarriages of justice where no one culpable has been held accountable. You need to have that media focus to ensure that resources are put into the investigation. Terry, it's been good to catch up. Thank you for your reflections. Thanks, Paul. There's Dr Terry Goldsworthy, the Associate Professor of Criminology from Bond University in Queensland, and it's nine to four. Spend your Saturday with Craig Hamilton. Snake season already. They're waking up. They're hungry. Billy Collett is from the Australian Reptile Park. To be honest, we're going to see more snake activity around our houses and workplaces coming into the warmer months because things are going to get really, really wet again. Snakes are going to be looking for those, those nice places to shelter. So they're going to be looking for dry spots. They need dry spots to camp up in. So houses are perfect spots, the back shed. Saturdays from 6am on ABC Newcastle. You would have noticed that in our suburban Australian streets there's a turf war going on. Teenagers are being attacked with knives and sometimes killed just for being in the wrong neighbourhood. Well, tonight's Four Corners lifts the lid on organised suburban crime, revealing the link between the teens on the streets and some of Australia's notorious crime families. Grace Tobin is one of the reporters who gained access to these young people who have been... Your local...